morning patrons and thanks for being so wonderful and supporting my channel and supporting independent filmmaking so yesterday we discussed double or triple redundancy as related to the Boeing 737 series and how the EU might well come down hard on Boeing for not having so-called triple redundancy built into any of the 737 aircraft in its history, where Airbus aircraft all have so-called triple redundancy, and so do many Boeings and other manufacturers. It's just the 737, which is a particularly old design, very reliable, built like a tank, and also extremely cheap to build. But I thought today we'd discuss redundancy. Now, I know you people out there in Patreon land, you all understand redundancy. But uh, Ken Whitfield got back to me and said, thanks very much for putting his letter on YouTube and Patreon, and he really values your comments. And I'm, I'm, I thanked him for writing it because I think he did it really well. But he did say he wondered if people really understood the debate between double or triple redundancy and what that means to flight safety. So I thought I would discuss it today and start a thread for you to chip in because I'm not an expert in this field, but I thought I'd just cover the basics. So the whole idea of redundancy is if something fails, you've got a backup. So in triple redundancy, if you've got erroneous input, you can, through software, look at the best of the three, and hopefully that will be the answer to the thing that's gone wrong. But let's go back to basics and talk about redundancy. And I think the angle of attack, OAA indicator, the little flying vane, or sometimes it's a solid state or a pressure inducer instrument on a plane is a perfect example of a really safety orientated flight instrument input device, which is prone to damage, prone to error, and needs some redundancy. So as a private pilot, <laughs> often an instrument might fail. The classic instrument that fails in uh, general aviation is you lose your vacuum pump because it's uh, just a graphite veins that produces a vacuum and sometimes the veins break. And some instruments are powered by this vacuum pump, such as your gyroscopes for your artificial horizon. But other instruments in the plane are electrically driven and also under VFR, visual flight rules, you should be looking out the plane. So for example, most GA planes don't have an angle of attack instrument because you don't need one because you're using your eyes to check the horizon line, say from the edge of the cowl. But on a jet aircraft, angle of attack instrument is vital. It's probably the most primary instrument or measurement tool for the autopilot and for the whole automation of an airplane, especially if you're landing in zero visibility. Because what it measures is the angle of wind, of air going over the wings. And it's not an intuitive thing that you can look at and check because as you pitch up the plane, the air going over the wings either goes nicely over the wings <laughs> in a kind of laminar flow, or as you increase the angle of attack, the air going over the wing tends to separate and that causes a partial or a full stall. So you need to know the angle of attack and it varies by airspeed, probably it varies slightly by air density, so altitude, but it's not something which you can see in your mind's eye. So, so you need to either look at visual clues or if you've lost those, your angle of attack instrument is really, really vital because it gives you warning signs for a potential stall. And that's useful when landing because you need to get into a landing configuration. And also you, it's very useful for pitching up on takeoff because it's possible to over-rotate and to get into this situation where the air separates from your wing. And you can have a takeoff stall, which people often don't consider, but it's very dangerous. 
So, redundancy. We have a family member who is actually a senior mechanic for a large international airline, and he says that the angle of attack instruments are uniquely vulnerable. They suffer from hangar rash, which is like bumping into things as you're moving the planes around on the ground. They're also very, very fragile. I mean, the classic angle of attack instrument is this. It's a little vein that sticks out maybe, uh, well, let's talk about one, that sticks out on the side of the nose of the aircraft and it flies. So it's mirroring what the wings are doing, or the air over the wings are doing. And it's just a flying vane with a axle into a potentiometer, a volume knob. And as it moves, it changes the uh, electrical signal. But I mean, you ding it, you, <laughs> you bird strike or icing. It's a lot of things that make these instruments vulnerable. And as I said, they're very important for the whole autopilot or any fly-by-wire system on a modern jet aircraft. So let's look at what Boeing does and let's look what Airbus does. Before, well, actually, before I do that, because I think Boeing do something a bit odd, especially on the Max 8 aircraft, let's look at single, double, and triple redundancy. So single redundancy is uh, no redundancy. You lose your angle of attack instrument and you've lost that input in the cockpit. Okay, so there's other instruments which might give you some clues about angle of attack, but Certainly, if it's an instrument driving a computer, that input's gone. So that's bad. So double redundancy is where you have two. So uh, if one fails, the other one can take over. It sounds like a great plan, but I'm going to go on to that in a minute. But triple redundancy is really the magic cure. Because if you've got three, if you lose one, you've got two others... To, to compare, you've always got three inputs to compare and take an average of. Suddenly anything with three in it is a magic number. And that's what Airbus and most other Boeing aircraft do. Having this triple redundancy in all critical flight systems. So you get it? So one, you lose it. Two, you can have a backup, but with three, you start having this statistical comparison, which is like really interesting. And that's what the European aviation industry want Boeing to have and what's not on any 737. But it gets worse. When I was reading about the Max 8 crashes, I was absolutely horrified with the angle of attack non-redundancy. So Max 8s actually have two angle of attack instruments. So you've got redundancy, if one breaks, you've got the other one. No, 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 and it's a oh, double no. It's just terrible. What actually they do is they, um, the software in the plane and the Max 8 planes alternate them. So on Mondays, you use the one on the left. On Tuesdays, you use the one on the right. Or, or in fact, every other flight, they switch to give one of them a rest or to give a statistical chance that one of them hasn't failed. I hate it, it's really rubbish. I mean, and that's what actually happened in the Ethiopia, sad Ethiopia crash, is that they lost an angle of attack in indicator, maintenance replaced it, but on the next flight, it actually was using the other one, which was also erroneous uh, and activating the MCAS system. I might have got a bit wrong, but anyway, this switching between them isn't redundancy. Redundancy is having two and comparing the two, and that's a much smarter thing to do. Or using two, and if one fails, isolating it and only using the other one. But having two and just alternating them on odd days of the week isn't, I don't think, redundancy. And I, 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 I thought that was really an odd solution on the Max 8. But I'd like to add an end note to this. Boeing actually are very famous for actually having a inherent redundancy in all their fleet. Boeing are the only aircraft that, well, Boeing are famous for having this direct control from the uh, yoke to the flight controls. I mean, obviously there are not wires or push rods, 
Well, they are, but they're not actually moving the control services because be, the forces would be too heavy for the pilots to do. But what they do is they're either wires or control push rods that go to hydraulic actuators directly. Whereas Airbus are total fly-by-wire. So a lot of Airbuses have actually joysticks to fly and they rely on a computer and an electrical signal from the joystick computer to the flight services. And they have triple wiring and triple computers, but there is no physical connection. And I think for many years, people like that Boeing, you could potentially fly a Boeing with everything switched off. But I'm not sure if that's true, but anyway. So Boeing are well famous for doing that. But I think the 737 fleet with only double redundancy, and that's not only the angle of attack instrument, that's all the primary flight systems, the control services, airspeed indicator, angle of attack, engine uh, management system, or have double redundancy, is a really old design. And I think having triple redundancy is smart because as I explained, three is a magic number, you can do a statistical analysis between the three and pick the good one. But I'd just like to end this with kind of a very personal statement, and I don't know if you agree with this. Am I actually seeing a back doorway of the EU, who very much are supporting Airbus, in getting back at Boeing by saying, oh, you Boeing 737s are old. They've only got double redundancy and Airbus are all triple redundancy. So we're going to ban you in Europe. Isn't that slightly protectionism for Airbus? Because I don't think there's anything that wrong with double redundancy. I think triple redundancy is better. But I do think that actually 737s as a type are on the way out. I mean, I think they need to actually move on from a design drawn on a drawing board in the 1950s. You know, they're 50 to 60 years old, the basic inherent design of 737s. And they've been the workhorse of us flying public and airlines for generations. But I think it's probably time to move to a safer or a more sophisticated model for an airplane. And I actually do believe that Boeing were pushing their luck with the MAX 8 series. I think it was one step too far on an old platform, which really couldn't be updated to the new high efficiency, larger bypass engines on an old jalopy. What do you think? Because the truth is out there. Thank <laughs> you.